Today, in the ninth lecture, we present the topic Kodungallur Bharani, an intimate event of resistance and revival by Dr. Manju Edachira. Dr. Manju Edachira is a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Delhi. Thank you, uh, Rajeshwari, for that warm welcome. And uh, yeah, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the general lecture series and also Kerala Museum for uh, putting this archive together, which is uh, now available online. So yeah, this is I would uh, like to appreciate this effort. And I'm very privileged to be a uh, part of this. And uh, thank you so much for inviting, to, uh, inviting me to be a uh, part of this lecture. So yeah, I'll uh, begin. So the uh, just before going uh, to the title, uh, I largely work on uh, Malayalam cinema, uh, but this is something which I started uh, a little later. So uh, it's also based on some of the field work which I did in 2017 and 2023. Uh, so yeah, as the title uh, uh, says it is uh, Kodungalur Bharani, an intimate event of resistance and revival. So, yeah, what is Kodungalur Bharani? Uh, so, uh, Kodungalur Bharani happens uh, in Kodungalur, a municipal town in Trishur district of Kerala, uh, which is kind of 32 kilometers away from here precisely. Uh, and uh, it is one of the prominent uh, temple festivals in Kerala which happens every year in the month of, uh, in the Malayalam month of Meenam or uh, Ma March, which comes largely in, in, in March. Uh, so yeah, I'll just show, oops, sorry. So this is uh, the map of Kodungallur. Uh, so I also have another map which kind of uh, gives a, a bigger picture of Kodungallur, which is also a historical map of uh, Musiris. So that's the second one. And uh, so this is the point uh, of uh, Kodungallur. And I would be talking about the temple and also uh, there is another, uh, the, this is called, like the major temple is called Mail Kavu and I'll also be talking about a uh, little bit on the, uh, on Kir Kavu which is, uh, which is another uh, temple nearby. So various studies have been carried out on the complex nature of the festival uh, in terms of its inclusiveness at the level of gender and caste and uh, as a resistance against Hindu religious practices and also uh, as a ritualistic performance of the devotees as well. So there are different ways. There are many studies on uh, Bharani. That is another important point. Uh, especially in Malayalam, uh, we have a lot of literature on Bharani and, uh, and from different uh, from different perspectives. Sure. So, and I attempt to argue that Kodungalur Bharani works as an intimate event while being a site of resistance against the hereditary hierarchical dominant society. So this is achieved at the level of space, that is rituals and travel, and language, which is Bharani Patil, and experience, that is the embodied performance of uh, devotion. So, uh, So this is uh, something which I would be largely talking about uh, in, in my lecture. So I would be looking at Barani as an intimate resistance of particularly of Dalits and other lower castes against the caste society in the earlier as well as the contemporary Kerala public sphere. At the same time, a revival of a casteless Buddhist past. So, uh, so Barani is filled with various uh, ritualistic practices and it's also an embodied devotional experience of the devotees, uh, predominantly from the Dalit and lower caste communities. And they travel from the Northern Kerala in, in general, like there are many people, but then in the major participants in the festival, is, uh, they come from the Northern part of Kerala. So the in, uh, it is infamous for, for Barani Pata or uh, what is called Lestari Pata, which can be roughly translated as songs of swear words or cuss words, which also have explicit sexual references. Uh, this is sung by the de devotees to please the goddess as an offering to her. 
These songs are generally defined as lewd, vulgar, and obscene, thereby deriding the divinity of the festival. Even though Barani Pata is only a part of the larger festival of Barani, where there are many other rituals, uh, it still remains the point of reference to this uh, festival because when we are, uh, when the like when we first hear the word Barani or Kodungulur Barani, what comes to my, our mind would be largely about this Barani Patil, and perhaps maybe the next would be the the image of uh, Komarangal or, or or the oracles. So yeah. So as I mentioned, I've conducted my fieldwork in 2017 and 2023, and uh, uh, so it's largely uh, uh, the first part which I did largely in Kirkava, which I'll come back to uh, later in the lecture. Uh, the second one was in uh, Kodungallur uh, Temple. So my interlocutors were largely devotees who came from northern Kerala and the local people from Kodungallur. Uh, so firstly, many of them were reluctant to talk to me, thinking that I I came from some media uh, houses uh, because they even uh, asked me, uh, they took some of the popular Malayalam channel names and asked me whether I'm from some of these channels and then they, were, they didn't want to talk to me because they felt that media kind of encroached their devotional as well as their personal space. So uh, once the uh, senior person with whom I spoke first kind of clarified that uh, I am a researcher who work uh, work on uh, Bharani, and then uh, then they started talking to me about their experience of uh, Bharani. So, so this lecture is based on this field work and also some of the secondary resources on 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 Bharani. So it has uh, five parts. First, I would be talking about the historical background, then the ritualistic space or the spaced rituals, which I call. And the third part would be as travel, travel as a shared experience, and then Bharani as carnival, and the language discourse of Bharani Patil, and the last part would be uh, Bharani as an embodied uh, performance. So uh, this is uh, this would be the uh, kind of structure of the talk. So uh, to talk about the historical background, there are two, three uh, major stories on Bharani. So the first one is, uh, uh, there is one, one story says that it is Cheran Chengutavan of Chera dynasty consecrated the idol of Kannagi around 1800 years ago, uh, which is Kannagi is a chief ca uh, character, I mean central character of the Tamil epic Silapathikaram. Uh, so that is one one story, and uh, supposedly Chengutavan built a shrine near Vanchi, which is also like uh, the Tiruvanchikulam uh, place with, uh, near Kodungallur. So this is one story, and there is another story which is connected to the myth of uh, Darigavadam or the killing of Darika. Uh, so this, in, as per this particular story, uh, so Badragali is said to have visited Kodungallur after killing Asura king Darika, and the temple is made the, to worship Kali. So this is more of a Hindu version of, of the story as well. Uh, this is the second story. So the third story, which is uh, on the Buddhist, uh, uh, from the Buddhist history, which is some, some historians have actually uh, argued that Barani was a tactical move by the upper caste Hindus to cast away the Buddhists from Kodungallur. So they give a lot of historical details, how it happened and uh, uh, what are the connections. So this, is, this can also be connected to the story of Kannagi, as Kannagi was worshipped by the Buddhist in the early days. Moreover, uh, there is another argument uh, by Sadashivan, which is uh, Buddhists of Kerala have not built many stupas and other structures, uh, but they convene their meetings and uh, prayers in the open spaces like groves or kaava. So kaava is, uh, Kodungalur is uh, known as Kodungalur kaava, uh, or actually kaava, not necessarily Kodungalur kaava, but it's Kurumba kaava. So kaava in Malayalam uh, suggests grove, or there are so many other uh, like if you put it together like flower garden which is Poongava or Kavu also suggests a place of serpent worship which is Pambungava but there are also many places like with the uh, suffix Kavu. It is also an ecological system with thick green cover and various species of animals and reptiles. 
So though Kodungallur is not a place of serpent worship, as in, in general, uh, the temple is known as Kurumbakavu, and this strengthens the traces of Buddhist inhabitants in the place. So uh, the people of Kodungallur use the term Kavu to suggest the town. So this is a very uh, common term uh, where uh, when they go to the town, they don't necessarily say that we are going to Kodungallur, but then people uh, of the uh, people of Kodungallur actually say that we'll see you at Kavu, or I just came back from Kavu, or uh, or I'm going to Kavu. So it's Kavu is this uh, Kavu actually that speciality stands for the whole town itself. So uh, so in uh, so Kavu suggests. Uh, uh, Ka so Kavu Tindal is one of the central ritual practices of Barani, where the devotees, mostly from the lower caste, enter the temple and supposedly pollute its surroundings by throwing stones and sticks on the roof of the temple and also by singing Theripata. So this is uh, the larger practice uh, of what is Kavu, Kavu Tindal. Uh, so uh, you can see this picture I took like this year, 2023. Uh, so you can see the image of what is Kavut in Dalat. They have, they have thrown away uh, uh, turmeric and so many other sticks, stones, paper, plastic, uh, many things on the on 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 the temple. So uh, so yeah, this is uh, so this is largely about the historical background and the connection with Kavu and the and Kavut in Dal. And the second part is on the uh, ritualis ritualistic spaces or the space rituals. So I'm not going uh, detail into the all uh, in uh, all the rituals, but then some of them I'll just tell to go into the argument. So, uh, so one of the major uh, this it kind of consists there is something called panchakarma uh, panchakarma puja, which is like of five offerings, including uh, which includes malsyam, which is fish. Mamsam, which is meat, and Maithunam, which is sex, Mudra is grain, and Madhyam, which is alcohol. So these are largely symbolic in nature, uh, and Barani Pada stands for sex in this case. But these songs are not just sexual invocations, uh, but are inherently political in nature, So which we will come uh, later in the lecture. So these are different. I mean, these rituals differ from the usual Brahminical temple practices, and and it is significant to look into the spaces of these uh, rituals during the festival. So, one is uh, it starts with Barani starts with a major ritual, which is Kori Kallu Moodle, or uh, which which is actually uh, a ritual in Barani where two circle-shaped stones or Bali Kallu. Uh, popularly known as Kori color, it's Kori, uh, Kori is uh, 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 like in this case like uh, it is chicken, but then it is uh, roosters they use. So yeah, color stone. So in the northern part of the temple, which this there are two Bali colors in the northern part of the temple, which will be covered with red silk cloth, and uh, and on top of it, the roosters will be offered to the goddess. I mean earlier, uh, roos uh, they were I mean roosters were sacrificed to offer blood, but these days that's not happening. But in the temple, but it happens outside. I mean in in most of the pujas in the houses and 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 in other. Uh, places, not necessarily in the, in the temple. So after the ritual, the roosters will be thrown into the crowd and the devotees compete to get the chicken. Kori the Moodle, so this is this kind of marks the beginning of Barani and a lot of uh, uh, rituals follow that. So uh, another important uh, space of Barani is uh, called Altara. Altara is a small platform built around the banyan tree. Uh, it's very common to temples in uh, Kerala, as we all know. Uh, and banyan tree is considered as holy in uh, both in Hinduism and also in Buddhism. So these are sacred places. According to Buddhism, uh, banyan tree is significant because Buddha attained enlightenment under the banyan tree. So that's one, uh, one uh, 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 explanation. So altaras also serve as a public space. I mean, uh, it is a major public space. Uh, so if it's within the temple, it's mostly Hindus. But then otherwise, uh, irrespective of the religion, people come and gather around uh, and to discuss. So Kodungalu temple has a lot of altaras and its surroundings. Uh, 
and those become significant during the course of barani where each group from each desham or the place has their own particular altaras or avagasha taras so during that particular like kavuthi intel that particular time of kavuthi intel except a uh, certain particular group no one can no one else can enter the tara so it is uh, that this is what adarsh argues in his work so that taras have certain people have or certain groups have right over each uh, tara or each platform so uh, so the space is very important as in the case of avakasha tara and also uh, called uh, pulapadam or pulayapadam so this is what i was mentioning in the beginning that uh, what is keer kaava or 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 the low place of worship pulaya padam is a place in kaaval kadavu which is almost half a kilometer away from kodungallur this place is also known as keer kaava which attracts attention only during bharani when kodungallur temple becomes mail kaava uh, the prominent or the high place of worship pulaya padam becomes uh, uh, the the pulay kaava padam becomes keer kaava or the lower place of uh, worship so uh, pulayas a dalit community in kerala perform the rituals in the temple and the person who performs puja is called vallon or valluvan usually the person who does puja in the temples uh, are called um, uh, in 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 malayalam it's pujari shanti or tirumeni mostly brahmins i mean also other castes these days but then yeah the term these are the major terms but it is interesting to look at the term vallon to the pulaya priest uh, so apparently uh, so adarsh argues that the name was given uh, to the vallon uh, by the kodungallur tampuran so that's one argument but to look at the uh, history of this particular term uh, it's uh, another re- reference can be the valluvars in tamil nadu which is a caste group uh, who are the hereditary priests who practice astrology astronomy and medicine they are believed to have been the priests of the pallava kings before coming to before the coming of brahmins uh they exalt the exalted position of valluvars in the social hierarchy is indicated by the inscriptions of that time they are the subsect of parayas or sambhavas or adi dravidas at present valluvar is one of the scheduled castes by the indian constitution so uh, valentine daniel in his work has argued that the priests of parayans are called the vallu uh, are called valluvars the same can be seen in gundard's uh, dictionary as well So Tiruvalluvar the great Tamil poet is believed to be from this particular community so Parayas or the Adi Dravidas a former untouchable caste of drummers consider Tiruvalluvar as their very own ancestor so uh, the name Valluvan to the Pulaya priest might have come from this Valluvars of Tamil Nadu which suggests the buddhist connection mentioned earlier as they were believed to be buddhist in the past so and also another historical work by uh, uh, ayer which is the tribes and castes of cochin and he notes that kodungallur bhagavathi is the guardian deity of the pulayas of cochin and she is rudely represented by an image or a stone on a raised piece of ground in the open air this was a historical work by ayer where he talks about each communities of cochin and there is a reference to kodungallur bhagavathi in that So uh, Kirkavu also witnesses a lot of ceremonies during the course of Bharani including the sacrifice of chicken. It is not a fully developed temple but a place without any building but a stone idol of the goddess. Mail Kavu and Keer Kavu are not peculiar to Kodungallur temple but to most of the Badragali temples uh, where Keer Kavu becomes important uh, on par with Mail Kavu and in some places more than uh, Mail Kavu. so however in kodungallur kirkavu becomes visible only during bharani uh, so that is another important thing otherwise that place is not necessarily uh, like uh, necessarily celebrated uh, or or people don't go regularly uh, i mean especially the general public so however in kodungallur uh, sorry as per one of the legends after killing darika Uh, the tired goddess visited the pulaya family at pulaya padam and asked for water she drank the water and blessed the ancestors of the pulaya family and said that her presence will be there and she asked them to worship her so this is a kind of a legend and 
with the cow they will have a means of life but ask them not to accumulate wealth in her like on her name because of this belief pulaya padam or the keer cow of kodungallur can never become a full fledged temple uh, though they receive plenty of money they are not supposed to earn from the temple which also adds to the economic dependence of the temple so they can see the you can see two pictures here the first one is the uh, is one uh, it's just the place of worship and the second one is the uh, uh, one which is built during uh, as a temporary setup which they uh, make during barani and they have uh, people give money and uh, all uh, ceremonies happen uh, there so yeah so the festival demarcates each ritualistic spaces and this could be seen as a reiteration of caste spaces as in the case of avagasha tara male cow and keer cow where rituals get specialized along with caste since dalits as untouchables have been distanced from themselves through the practice of di- ritual distancing from their heritage history culture religion and so on they were made to belong to some other time and space so how does barani as devotional performance or resistance bring them nearer to themselves so that's something which we will be seeing in the next part which is travel as a shared experience so as opposed to talapuli which is another major festival in 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 kodungallur barani is celebrated mostly by the outsiders of the region who travel all the way from different parts of the state also from outside uh, and it is also a festival of travel for the devotees uh, and it is interesting to note the lack of local participation in the bharani festival so you see very less local participation uh, in the bharani since it is considered as a lower caste festival the local upper caste hindus do not participate in it uh, interestingly even most of the uh, public like uh, even including lower caste population also uh, local lo- lower caste uh, lower caste population also abstain from the festival for a particular period of barani the space belongs to the devotees and the devotees belong to the speciality of kodungallur where the locals who actually belong to the place keep away from the temple premises here the space creates certain intimacies while trampering with the other in other words the speciality and the temporality of barani form a particular kind of intimacy which encounter the power structure of caste society so it's kind of happens during that period so but then uh, barani is accepted as a spectacle to be seen in television a live show to be watched most of the local television channels have live telecast of bharani the same local population population watch the live telecast of the festival although they don't participate or attend the festival here the mediated site becomes exciting whereas the actual presence is undesirable so media negotiates a space between the actual festival and the living room space of the houses and presents it as a spectacle which becomes less problematic to the audience then what be- what becomes more pro- problematic about barani for the people who are mere spectators is the language of barani pada so what is problem is the language in this case because people would like to watch it on television so the devotees travel mostly in private vehicles especially vans and buses owning a space to travel to the destination a mobile space most of these vehicles are rented by them for the particular purpose and this rented space which is also mobile becomes a community space for a stipulated time the travel becomes a celebration a coming together with music and dance they leave their individual homes behind to travel toward the destination but create a new collectives while traveling and after reaching the temple some of the locals whose ancestors used to participate in the festival before see this as a get together time as many of the relatives from different part of the state come to their houses to attend the festival so for them the ritual ritualistic aspect of the uh, festival becomes irrelevant whereas the coming together of their people 
become more important. So contrary to the popular conception about Bharanikar, as not so educated people, the group with whom I interacted was diverse in nature. So I met a group who came from the northern part of Kerala, I mean, largely from Tirur from, uh, in Malapuram. So for instance, their Mupan or the chief uh, chieftain was a retired deputy Tasildar, whereas another person was a daily wage laborer who was also the SC Federation local committee president. And he identifies himself as a social worker. While the Mupan spoke about the rituals, devotion, and the ceremonies of Bharani, the other one elaborated on the slave past of the communities who come for Bharani and the significance of Kirkavu or the Pulayapada. He also recollected, recollected the Buddhist past of Dalit communities and the, way, and the way they were exorcised by the Brahminical forces. Interestingly, most of the people who participate in the festival perform the rituals rigorously before and during the course of the festival. So a lot of uh, uh, rituals happen before coming uh, to, the, to the actual place because at, uh, at their own places they will have uh, different groups and they would have a chief and they would arrange uh, a food and they invite friends and relatives and neighbors to attend ceremonies and uh, so it is, it is a get together. But unlike other temple related ceremonial food practices, meat based food is a must and chicken curry is the main item. A similar but not the same kind of get together happens before Shabarimala visit which is considered as more sacred and popular whereas Kodungalur Bharani becomes less sacred and infamous. Shabarimala visit also upholds vegetarianism but Bharani does not create a veg non-veg binary but offers an inclusive diet. Chicken curry, dry prawns, sardines are some of the delicacies during the period along with some vegetarian curries. While Shabrimala becomes a holy place within the popular narratives, Kodungallur is the undesired devotional space in general. Both the occasions create a space to come together for the people, mostly within the religious structure of Hinduism, which works on the very foundational discriminatory practice of India, that is the caste system. Nevertheless, the significance of Bharani as a festival lies in this conundrum of religiosity, where the festival becomes a resistance against the same religion but within the religious structure of Hinduism. So the devotees come to Kodungalur in big groups including old people and kids who stay in Kava and nearby places during Bharani. They even bring food items uh, including alcohol and uh, chicken and cook in the surroundings of this temple and nearby houses. So you can see this is also taken in uh, some uh, the place near uh, Kirkava. Uh, the people who participate in the festival are called Bharanikar. Like it's, they are largely called as Bharanikar. This is a term which is always used in plural, enhancing the collective nature of the festival. You don't tell like a one per, a particular person as Bharanikar and or Bharanikari, but then it's largely Bharanikar. In fact, they travel, cook, eat, drink, and sing together, and Bharani becomes the cause of this uh, get-together, a coming together of the otherwise fragmented communities. Because of the non-conventional nature of Bharani, a lot of people who are not necessarily believers attend the festival just to meet friends and family. This could also be seen in even the social media uh, uh, pages, where people just go to see their friends. So this creates V ness, rather what is in Malayalam termed as Nammal, which is more of an inclusive V. While the locals claim that it is not Nyangalode festival, uh, there is a saying that Bharani is not uh, like uh, Bharani is not of the people. Uh, it's not for the people of Kodungallur. Bharani Kodungallur karda dalla, uh, but it's outsiders. Uh, so. Uh, while the locals claim that it is not Nyangalude festival, many people who attended Bharani noted that it is Namude festival. 
instead of creating the binary of nyangal and ningal, which is which can be roughly translated as us and them, or we and they, or our and your, uh, Baranika stressed on the normalness of the event. Here, Namude stands for an inclusive category of we or our, which includes both the speaker and the listener. Whereas Nyangal is an exclusive category used to distinguish one group from another. Thus, Namude is suggestive of an intimacy which is temporal and spatial through an ephemeral belonging. So this is only for a particular time period. As, as Chakrabarti notes, belonging through intimacy can result into a bond of diverse subcultures of resistance through a belonging that necessarily does not appropriate or hybridize identity, but assist in a performative belonging of togetherness without any premeditative agenda. So thus, the normalness of Parani offers a togetherness beyond the enclosing system of uh, caste. So next part is Bharani uh, as carnival. So uh, earlier, Barani was the only occasion when Dalits and lower castes were allowed inside the temple. So it worked as a safety valve to bring out anger and frustration of the lo lower caste people against the caste system. We can find parallels between Barani and Bhaktin's co co uh, concept of carnival of the medieval period. For Bhaktin, carnivals are occasions in which the political and legal political, legal, and ideological authority of both the church and the state were inverted temporarily during the anarchic and the liberating period of the carnival. Here, the inversion happens only for a particular time and a particular space. As mentioned before, the Kaudindal ceremony is the actual practice of subversion, where the lower caste devotees were permitted to enter the premises of the temple and pollute the place. A closer look at the practice suggests that the devotees do not enter the inner part of the temple, this is on the uh, day of Kaudindal, but the outer compound of the temple and throw stones, sticks, papers and even plastic waste. It is only after the ritual purification the temple is reopened for the general public. So this, when we look into the concept of carnival through Bharani, uh, there are many similarities but uh, there are many differences as well. So Carnival created an atmosphere of equality by suspending all the hierarchical precedents where a special form of free and familiar contact was established among the people. It was not a spectacle seen by the people, but they lived in it, and during the time of the festival, there was no life outside of it. So this is uh, Bhaktin's uh, uh, idea of uh, what is a Carnival. As opposed to the official feast, one might say that Carnival celebrated temporary li liberation from the prevailing truth and from the established order. It marked the suspension of all hierarchical rank, privileges, norms, and prohibitions. Carnival was the true feast of time, feast of becoming, change, and renewal. It was hostile to all that was immortalized and completed. So. Uh, Contrary to Carnival, Barani doesn't create equality among all sections of people. Although it was the only occasion when Dalits and lower castes were permitted to enter the temple compound, it can be seen as a move to incorporate them to the sacred walls of Hinduism, but a mere safety valve to take out the anger and frustration among them. Even though there are uh, discourses around Bharani which celebrates its inclusiveness in terms of caste, I argue that it is a strategy to mask the casteist nature of the festival. In fact, Bharani still operates within the caste structure of Hinduism where each caste has been given a particular role to play in the ritualistic practices. This is interpreted in the dominant discourse as a prog progressive move by incorporating all the castes and it is impossible to have the festival without all of them. But it can be argued that it reinforces the caste system and the Varna system by compartmentalizing different communities in terms of performing different roles. So this is where the resistance of the, uh, of the oppressed caste communities come into play. So the language discourse of Bharani Patil, it is uh, 
It is no news that the upper caste Hindus, while discriminating and oppressing incessantly, kept Dalits and lower caste away from the sacred spaces of Kerala, thereby inscribing sacrality upon themselves. It is only through outcasting somebody or avarnanizing that caste and varna, body becomes sacral. It is coincidental to the way in which domineering language works towards sacrality. Something else within should be inscribed profane, in other words, outcasted. The question is how language plays a role in inscribing Bharani as outcasted. Language in Kerala has been argued works within the hegemonic casteist patriarchal structure, which is a marker of identity. In this context, Bharani Pattu attains its status as uncivilized and inferior in the popular discourse. The oral and profane nature of these songs mark them out of the cultural space which is elite and caste-free of modern Kerala. The profanity of these songs stems out from its explicit sexual references. Unlike the Sanskritic verses sung in the temple, Bharani songs are fully in Malayalam and mostly in uh, local dialects. The Sanskritic verses mentioned above are also explicitly sexual in nature but are treated as sacred. Here, Bharani songs are placed as an other to the traditional Malayalam language which claims to be pure and sacred in nature. Then Bharani interestingly becomes profane and sacral at once. Hence, it ruptures the idea of Malayalam inscribed as pure, sacral and elite while it is recited just like the Sanskrit shlokas in the temple. So if, you, if we look into the etymology of the word Tari, uh, uh, it is, it's quite interesting because uh, terigal must be words which are placed outside the accepted structure of a particular language, here Malayalam. So tarichu poga in Malayalam means to slip away. So terigal might have slipped away from the standard form of the language. Uh, also, tari is the imperative form of the Tamil word terikal, which means to scatter, spray and splash. So terikal has the same uh, meaning in Malayalam as well, but when separated, teri stands for swear words in Malayalam. So terichavan and terichaval are used to suggest people who do socially unacceptable things. So this I take from Adarsh. Uh, in a way, they are expelled lots as teri, which is pushed away from the acceptable form of uh, language. So devotees of Bharani call Bharani Pata as Pacha Pata. So Pacha has also has a lot of uh, meanings in Malayalam, though the intended meaning here must be pure, fresh, raw, as in Pacha Malayalam, uh, Pacha Vellam, Pacha Malsyam, and even Pacha Dari. So Gundert in his Malayalam English Dictionary notes that the meaning of Pacha Basha is unartificial, simple language, and the meaning of Pacha Paraga is frankly. So the we can kind of tell that Pacha Pate can be considered as the unartificial, simple, raw songs uh, sung frankly. But later when Malayalam became standardized, Pacha Pate became Teri Pate and placed uh, outside uh, the accepted norms of the language. Uh, so Gundar's dictionary also suggests the meaning of uh, the word Teri as snappish, dashing and slashing, which is quite similar to the present Tamil meaning of the word. I mean, we also have a film called Tari in, in, in Tamil. However, the meaning of the word Terivaka is given as offensive, mischievous and indecent words, chiefly to abuse in anger. At present, Tari in Malayalam is only used in the sense of Terivaka, where the early meaning is erased. So it is significant to look into the Sanskritization of Malayalam, uh, where some words from Tamil become colloquial and substandard, in this case, it kind of erases the earlier, uh, I mean, the original Tamil as well as the early Malayalam meanings and attained a different meaning altogether. So the connection between caste and language cannot be neglected in the discourse of language in India. Language as a marker of identity plays an important role in the inhuman practice of untouchability. So Sundar Sarukai, in his essay, Phenomenology of Untouchability, discusses the importance of language philosophically in relation to the concept of untouchability. So he says, you can see here, contact is always more than the physical one. There are different modes present in every single physical contact, one which is the physical, of course, but there is also a transcendent dimension. 
the use of language and invocation of words and chants as part of the bathing process suggests the transcendent contact of the body and words or sound or language so he goes beyond the physical contact of bodies or things to the transcendental level of language which can't be touched physically to ex explicate the concept of untouchability so language works here at the symbolic level where it possesses the ability to pu uh, pu purify and at the same time pollute but gopal guru suggests that sarukai's argument of the contact of the body and word is not applicable in the case of the untouchables so he writes in case of the untouchables as walking carrion with a concentrated expression of repulsion uh, there is a complete denial of this contact this is because of the words do not belong ontologically to the brahman body they flow from the mouth of the walking carrion a potent source of pollution thus at one level the untouchables were prohibited from producing high pitched sounds as it was considered polluting as far as the pure untouchables are concerned which is which are the brahmins at another level even the low pitched sound is considered polluting by the upper caste since the sound accesses the space it can be it can become the source of pollution as well in order to avoid the menace of words coming from the untouchables the upper caste particularly the brahmins force the untouchables to eliminate the word and replace it with sound this is why uh, people were supposed to make sound when they were walking when the sound itself becomes a source of pollution words add severity to it in the case of bharani it is the same language which operates within the binary discourse of purity pollution it is through language that the sacred gets polluted at a metaphysical level to put it in the terms of the popular discourse on bharani taripata becomes the agency of pollution the reiteration of mantras and chants in the ritualistic practices of hindu tradition related to purity elevates language to a metaphysical level of purity and pollution language in this case works as a polluting agent at the same time an antidote to pollution so uh, most of the devotees belong to the untouchable caste and their language also becomes impure according to the traditional standards of malayalam so even the very caste names become expletives and swear words in Mal uh, of malayalam language so it is also through language that dalits and lower castes are kept outside the mainstream language or even the mainstream so there are uh, other works one is uh, to look at the college magazine guruvayurappan college magazine vishwavikhya that they had actually uh, kind of went into the history of some of these words and another one which is interesting is rupesh kumar's documentary by the side of a river uh, it attempts to reread the myth of the art form potentium which is performed by the pulaya and malaya communities of uh, north malabar in kerala uh, so uh, the kind of the documentary kind of problematizes the politics of naming behind potentium so uh, the malayalam word potent denotes either mentally retarded or deaf and dumb whereas the character in potentium myth is highly intellectual in nature so the question is like who decides the name potent so the, so how do we understand the ritualistic practices of dalits like potentium which is outside the structure of hinduism so uh, also even uh, if we look at some of the uh, uh, some of the other uh, sayings in malayalam uh, such as paranjulugal uh, which is also devised in the same structure uh, even through language dalits are placed outside time and space which can be seen like in when we talk about certain caste you can you can't be sure of uh, their things until until morning or uh, you can't be uh, uh, you uh, or no no matter whatever happens certain caste situation will never be better uh, so there are there are uh, similar uh, similar sayings in 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 malayalam especially when it comes to dalit communities so it reveals the uncertainty attributed to dalits by the dominant society where a better name for them is denied even in uh, where a better time for them is denied even in language so it is in this context that barani attains uh, its uh, uh, significance so i'll go to my last section which is barani as an embodied 
प्रैक्टिस सो another image which comes to your mind on barani is this oracles cutting their head and 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 bleeding images so uh it is perceived as an extreme devotional practice by the malayali community where the acts of komarangal or the oracles of the goddess become primitive the komarangal are believed to be the representations of the goddess who are dressed in red and adorned with heavy ritual ornaments and garlands cut their foreheads with swords in a possessed state uh and they usually largely use turmeric powder as an antiseptic and they don't usually go to uh doctors or hospital uh yeah you can see the uh what uh their uh, what is the description of this uh, people around i'll just go to the next uh so this is the this is the image in uh, kodungallur temple and this is in uh, keerkavu so can see uh, uh, both men and women uh, around uh so this is the last part i'll uh, wind up in 5 minutes maybe uh yeah so so this uh, even though gents describes as the oracles as veliche padanmar they are widely known as komarangal uh so their embodied experience is perceived as an extreme devotional practice by the malayali community where the acts of the devotees are seen as irrational and absurd so the irrationality that is etched in the discourse of barani could be read in the framework of intimacy's inevitable paradoxes in which the devotional performance to gratify the deity becomes intense and powerful to an extent self injuring ironically this devotional practice is a simultaneous temporal withdrawal from the self which is transcendental in nature when this becomes a problematic devotional masochism in the popular discourse then how do we understand the killing of dalits and the lower caste in the present context in the name of caste this is a paradox of time a time when lower caste practices become premodern and the upper caste practices become normalized and secularized so i would make a comparison between body art where the body is treated as something to be creatively designed and it becomes symbolic of modern and fashion although it also follows the method of self injury the modern fashionable self asserts its identity through these practices of self making where pain is a means to achieve the targeted end coming back to the case of bharani the devotional act of self injury occurs uh occurs at the process state of the devotees where the self withdraws from itself at that particular moment most of the komarangal perform these devotional acts not for themselves but as an offering to the goddess for their people and community so the withdrawal of the self not only at the level of transcendence but also at the level of selfless act for a collective whole so it's uh, interestingly this this very devotional extremity is always linked up to the tamils in the dominant malayalam discourses where the dynamics of caste structures the tamil identity by conferring it a subaltern status while upholding an elite malayali caste self here the image of the internal other which is the dalits the tribes and the lower caste is projected through the subaltern identity of the tamils language also functions within this othering where the influence of tamil in malayalam is distinct so as to elevate the standard malayalam which is supposedly the sanskritized malayalam the description on the malayalam word theory explicate the process of erasing the tamil meaning thereby moving away from the earlier tamil as well as Malaya as well as a malayalam meaning of the word despite the fact that barani songs are seen as obscene and vulgar it is appropriated in the mainstream media without uh without this whatever obscenity or uh or or the vulgar language thereby sanitizing it according to the popular taste so more than the lyrics it is a folkish rhythm of these songs which capture the attention of the audience and uh, some of the music brands bands also improvise these songs retaining the rhythm and deliberately replacing the lyrics to cater to the common interest uh so and also sometimes these are also contemporary uh, these are takes on contemporary uh socio political scenario as well so uh so uh this also talks about some of the 
uh, to uh, talk against the uh, oppression uh, faced by these communities. So uh, some of the Barani songs have explicit also reference to the police, where the devotees abuse the police in, the, in their presence, and police usually don't, uh, don't react. This again strengthens the view that Barani provides an opportunity to react against the system, but in a way which is orchestrated by the state. Uh, the state is again uh, could be seen as a representative of the traditional hierarchical society as in the process of bureaucratization here. Hence the language of Bharani, uh, Bharani Pata, a form of devotion, becomes the resistance to against the hereditary hierarchical dominant society. So to conclude, uh, Kodungalur Bharani as historically and culturally significant festival offers new thoughts on the coming together of the otherwise fragmented communities. Even though it remains a devotional practice within the structure of Hinduism, it simultaneously questions the caste society through its language and rituals. Thus, Bharani works as an intimate resistance against the normative structures of power, at the same time invokes the emancipatory histories of becoming beyond caste enclosures. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Manjun, for the lecture. Uh, we are over in the session for Q&A now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. I will pass the microphone to you. Hi, Manjun. I am Deepak. Great to be here. And uh, reference to the five offerings that you were mentioning, fish, meat, etc. I would like to bring to your attention that in the Bharatiya uh, Samskara there are three types of worshipping. One is Sattvamana Pratana, and second is Rajavana Pratana, and third is Tamavana Pratana. All are equally considered actually. But there are misconceptions about this that Sattvamana based offering is superior, Rajavana is, it comes next, and Tamavana is inferior. This misconception is there, however, if you refer to the text, it will show that uh, in a temple earlier, there used to, one priest used to go, a Brahmin priest used to go, and he used to conduct ceremonies in accordance to the Sattvaguna practice. But he was not very pious. But then, there came one uh, one person who was just hunting and uh, finding his uh, food and he started the offering in the, uh, the meat. Finally, this was the worshipping was for Shiva. So finally, Lord uh, wanted to, to test them, who is more pious, who is more offering. So on seventh day, the priest found that the Shivalika is with throwing bread from one of the eyes of the Shiva. Three eyes are there. So he, uh, he thought that this is an indication that some danger is going to come and I have to flee. So he flew from the place. Next, uh, the other person came. He was with a lower caste. He immediately found because of his, his pious attitude, he found you know, God is suffering. So what should I do? He immediately removed his, one of his eyes, offered him. So immediately that stopped. The, the, the blood flow was stopped. Immediately he found that the blood is flowing from the other eye. So he again offered his second eye, keeping one leg on the face of the, the place where he has to, because if he removed both his eyes, he can't see. So that way he proved that the, although the kind of offering is not Satoguna or Rajoguna, it is Samoguna practice because he has offering meat. But the text itself says it is not the kind of division of Sattvaguna, Rajoguna, or Tamaguna, but it is actually the Bhakti. So I would like to bring to your attention that what matters is the Bhakti, but there is a misconception in the community. But you, as a researcher, I suggest that you should not go by that. You should go by the text. Can I respond to that? 
yeah thank you thank you so much for that uh, story uh, and uh, it's also like Im important to look at not just so one of the things uh, for me as a researcher to look at all kinds of material both textual uh, also ethnographic so it is not just one but the story is also interesting for me because why it has to be a lower caste person who has to offer his eyes while uh, while the uh, other person does not do anything so stories are also based on who does what and who does certain sacrifice and who is who is forced to do that or who has to do it so that these stories can also take us to another uh, like level of perhaps not necessarily one of the interesting things which uh, also from others work is that Bharani is at once multiple so there are multiple readings and layers to the meaning so that in that sense this is this could be one but also there there are other meanings which need not be always on the devotional uh, level but it could be also political it could be also affective it could be also at the level of intimacy so that's what i am trying to argue in this but anyway thanks for the stories thank you yeah, uh, just wanted to ask you so there's a little part next to the question so this uh, temple has this connections with uh, the story of kandagi So, uh, even the idol, if you look at uh, uh, you know, the posture of the idol, suggests that it could be Kandaki, it is not another Kandaki. Uh, also, considering that from the early Dravidian uh, uh, worship practices, going into Buddhism at some point, because I think Charanam Perumar had actually himself had converted into Buddhism, and there, is a, there are a lot of texts which say, Kodanagar uh, temple was a Buddhist uh, uh, temple, Buddhist place for some time. And then again, uh, during the Hinduism revival, uh, during Shankaracharya's time, it again became a uh, Hindu temple with uh, Madhagali as the main deity and of course with other uh, uh, sub deities. So, my uh, question is it's actually quite unusual for. Hindu temples, otherwise uh, in Kerala, to have a very strong, uh, uh, you know, the Rupata kind of a practice, uh, it's not seen anywhere else like, in, my own, in my knowledge. So, are there any parallels that you have seen uh, anywhere, uh, whether in, you know, in Kerala or outside? And also, is there any particular cultural context in history because of which this started? Because there could have been some reason. For something like some very unique thing like this happen, I mean, probably an event or maybe a change in the cultural scene, uh, you know, change or change in community structure or something like that, or a forced event, something. Have you come across anything like that which could have actually given origin to some, something like this? Thank you, um, and thank you for all that. Uh, so many information as well. So yeah, uh, to start off with the history of Kannagi, yeah, there are many works on Kannagi, and also on the there is a wooden idol of uh, I think wooden, I, if I'm not wrong, uh, idol of uh, this Vasuri Mala uh, is placed uh, uh, inside uh, uh, inside Kodungallur Temple. So that is also considered as uh, as you mentioned Kannagi, and uh, also Buddhist histories. Like I found a lot of information and materials to prove that these are some of the Buddhist practices also like regarding uh, uh, this coming together as like community, the Sanghas and uh, also on uh, uh, the the, uh, the Kava and the meeting place and, and the relation with uh, also the Altaras, all these things actually gave uh, uh, a lot of actually information. So one of the things I was not uh, uh, I was not trying to actually uh, just just tell that this is the only history, but I was like, what is especially through the people with whom I spoke. So many of them told different different stories. So some of them actually believe in uh, like the like Bhadragali uh, worship, whereas a lot of people who who come for the 
uh, the whole uh, procession or for the whole pro like festival actually believe in this Buddhist past and they are politically conscious. Uh, they also like identify themselves as social uh, activists and, and but for them it is also the community so they just come and to meet people so that is uh, so in that sense that I haven't found like uh, this is one because because there are many historical materials which tells uh, perhaps this is one of the strongest because it has uh, while those are largely legends this is kind of historical in that uh, in that sense that is one thing and parallels i haven't found uh, exact parallels but then uh, i was uh, told by a friend that uh, there was this namashudra movement in bengal uh, where uh, they also had uh, kind of this is an again an untouchable movement uh, like not the present one the earlier one which wo which was there so they trace back their history right now so that they also had this possessed state and 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 the way they were I'm not sure about the third part uh, uh, that thing but then there is always a resistance towards the uh, dominant like uh, caste dominance so this was some kind of like not necessarily exact parallel but then something which while I was talking this uh, somebody told me about this and uh, in terms of a particular kind of event I am not like sure because there are many again uh, multiple stories regarding it so there is uh, uh, there are like recent like people tell different stories such as uh, this is to uh, oust the Buddhists from that particular place or or uh, or there are like different historical reasons they uh, they give so I haven't found the exact uh, event but thank you thank you so much for that input yeah thank you
I think I'll take these three together. Okay. Uh, so yeah, thanks for all the questions. I will try to put them together and then try to answer because most of them are also uh, in connection to the historical uh, aspects. So firstly, on the uh, yeah, th thanks for bringing that uh, parallel of uh, Chertala and Purapata. So I haven't looked much deeply into it. So as I was telling, this is also something which I started working uh, recently because I largely work on uh, cinema. So and even my entry to the uh, to this field is also through some of the documentaries on Barani and also on uh, uh, on some of these practices. So I came through the world of like visuals and and then i went to the ethnographic research so his uh, about history so my reading of the history is largely through the secondary materials where different kinds of uh, like people have written on 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 the on the history of kodungallur on the history of even musaris and and also the buddhist connections so uh, that is one uh, one way of like my entry point to the to the uh, to this particular to this particular research and uh, to talk about this uh, 
also on the buddhist uh, uh, the buddhist histories i mean actually uh, many of you have pointed out and today is also an important day today is uh, october 14 today is uh, mahaparivartan divas so this is also an occasion to talk about it and i'm uh, delighted to talk about this today uh, on the uh, on on this day so yeah one of the Uh, so the, the questions on Aryan invasion and Buddhism is uh, is something which is very important because a lot of historical works also men mention this particular uh, like the shift which happened, and uh, and uh, one of the things I haven't meant like I haven't gone deep into that. I just took history as a backdrop to talk about. this particular uh, this intimacy of the event because which as i mentioned it was largely through the information given by the people who participated in the festival not necessarily a historical work because like i am also not a historian so it's largely taken from other sources and secondly uh on this uh, on the question of the tantric buddhism and and the history of this uh, this particular event which is also the reason why i haven't gone deep into it uh, one of the things i wanted to look into the th three uh, three uh uh three categories or 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 three issues which is such as i mentioned it which was speciality and uh, uh language and and the experience so one of the things like history is more important when it comes to also the spatial question so whatever i could collect it's largely through people who spoke or or they would connect a little back but not necessarily as adra mentioned uh it's very uh, difficult to find these details like that is one of the things which because you maybe like it's uh, you can only find it maybe some of the old malayalam texts but otherwise it's it's uh, there are works because i've gone through some of the works but uh, many like as i mentioned like there are multiple stories so it is it's very difficult to pinpoint unless and un, un, uh, like until like you do a research which is only into the like into the archives like as uh, uh, perhaps if even the absence of archives would give us more information or the or the absent archives would give different like ways of reading into it which is an which is one way of looking into this perhaps uh, i mean thanks for all the uh, question because that is also one way to open up the question of history and uh, kodungallur bharani and uh, yeah so and also for the uh, pura patta connection with because i haven't uh, looked into it and and i haven't made the parallel so that's one of the ways of looking into it because i have only heard some stories from as i mentioned it's a bengal story but this is not uh, that's not a temple uh, uh, issue that's more of a political or or a mob uh, social mobilization but this is uh, more important because of the buddhist connection as well how something actually changed over a period of time so that is uh, that's something which could be looked at and and thank you for that if i answered any of you in some ways just yeah wanted, yeah just wanted to point out uh, just one of the questions uh, that was asked about the uh, buddhist Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Adira. Yeah. Yeah, sure. A quick question. Yeah. Uh, I want to specifically talk about the the your title. Okay. So having the course of interviewing people uh, from the difference, uh, I'm just seeing this as a moment of resistance, like how you wanted it to look, you know. So have you seen any change over the years in both the intimacy of the event as well as the resistance of the event? Have you been able to talk through the ages to different people who have participated in it? That it has changed over years. 
in both these categories. Thank you. So uh, one of the things I found uh, quite interesting is that I uh, so I did like field work twice, which is one was 2017 and one was in 2023. So uh, in terms of uh, the title, as I mentioned, it is resistance and revival. Resistance, which is against Hinduism and revival, was a Buddhist past. So that way, that's the title which I formed. And uh, so the 2017 people, I mean, uh, if you have mentioned the age group of people or people have changed over a period of time. So it's so both. So in terms of age group of people, like uh, mostly old people were talking in, as I mentioned, like more uh, more in terms of the rituals, devotion, practice, uh, and uh, very few of them also told uh, the caste histories as well. So it's not necessarily uh, that they only spoke about devotion, but they were also aware or, or they wanted to talk about these aspects as well. But then they had a mix of both, while uh, some of the younger population who just came from uh, for the, when it's not like very young as in, uh, they must be in their uh, 40s uh, or 50s, and even they told about uh, about this the, about Barani as a resistant practice. So that happened. And one difference which I could sense in the 2023 is that it was post-COVID, and people were very happy to be uh, part of the event. And most of them, uh, also I met people of like very young age. They just came. Uh, many of them were not even bothered about what is happening around. They just came for the whole spectacle and the whole experience and and the whole coming together of uh, of of people. So they uh, they were happy to be part of it, not necessarily at the like not necessarily uh, bothered about what is what is the devotional aspect of it. Now, of course, some of them were, but others were not much like those who were uh, around with the older population. So so the they were more into, uh, they kind of knew or, or they kind of uh, exhibited this, uh, uh, their knowledge about the, the, the resistance practice of, resistant practice of Barani, but then they were largely, uh, like they were actually celebrating or they were enjoying the moment. So these are some of the things and some of them actually spoke about the revival or not necessarily, they didn't uh, mention the word revival, they spoke about this Buddhist past. So I am trying to read it as a revival of a certain history, which is at once a resistance towards Hinduism because a, a lot of people uh, actually talk about what happened in the particular religious structure. But the larger uh, thing is that it's going beyond that. So how do you actually go beyond that? It is through the revival of a Buddhist past. And, and that's where some of the comments which they were also talking about how it could be connected. And that's something which, which can actually give more uh, information on this aspect of this intimacy in that level. So intimacy in terms of travel, intimacy in terms of space or rituals, and, and also language and also experience. So that's that's the, I'm, I take this particular intimate event to, to talk about this, uh, both res resistance and uh, revival at the same time. So yeah, thank you. know that uh, we'll be doing uh, much more discussion after we close. Um, for now, I'd like to uh, thank you, Dr. Madhuri Matira, on behalf of the Kerala Museum and the Mahanaya Foundation, um, for an excellent lecture you're leading on the com complexities of the Bani Festival and also the use of language for subversion of caste. Um, the journal lecture series is made possible with the support of the Geodet Foundation, and we extend our heartfelt thanks to them for their partnership and commitment to this exciting program. With every lecture, we have a wonderful expansion of interconnected ideas, and especially with work that pulls from multiple sources like yours, um, we end up with a very rich uh, archive, and it's all thanks to the generosity of our speakers and people like you. Please accept this small gift. Uh, I hope you don't already have this <laughs> Thank you. I would also like to thank the entire journal team with Raji and Anil curating the programs and Sarah and Nawaz on the um, social media and the tech. And I'd like to make special mention.
passion of the Gala Museum team who has put us behind the success of every event we organize here. Jana Talks are programmed for every alternate Saturday for now, so mark your calendars for the next one. Um, and uh, it should be very exciting uh, by Sebastian Dillard. Uh, and uh, I think, yeah, yeah. so uh, also, um, please follow our handles. Uh, where we post all our updates um, and thank you again for joining us uh, really traffic and everything on Saturday evening hopefully we'll have all enough for you to enjoy your Saturday night uh, enjoy your weekend thank you, see you again in the next one Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Aditi. Thanks, Rajeshwari. And thanks for this wonderful audience who are very engaging. And thank you so much.